You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. This week, we join Pastor Gary Ziegler as he continues his teaching on the subject, Do You Have the Fear of God? This is part two. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When spirit food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. And that which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God. I am what the word of God says I am. I can do what the word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's Word is working mightily in my life, being confirmed with signs following. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah and amen. I'm going to be teaching on the subject again do you have the fear of God? Do you have the fear of God? And when I ask the question, do you have the fear of God? That's not saying that God is looked upon by you as someone whom you don't want to fellowship with or someone whom you're trying to get away from or someone that you are in, you're terrorized by. No. But when I say, do you have the fear of God? That means in my heart, there is a deep knowledge that God is real and he must be respected and honored and must be obeyed. I know that he's real and he does speak to the hearts of people. And so when I say, do you have the fear of God? I'm really referring to, do you have a recognition? Do you have a, a, a place in your heart that God occupies that no one else can possibly occupy? That God is the love of your life. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Revelations chapter 19, verse 5. Revelations chapter 19, we'll look at verse 5 together. When you have a fear of God, there are certain things you just will not do in life. But when you have a fear of God, there are reasons as to why you live the way you live. You're to live holy. You're to live respectfully. You're to live honoring God and honoring those whom he tells you to honor. Revelations chapter 19 verse 5 says, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his saints, and ye that fear him, both small and and great. Let's all read Revelations chapter 19, verse 5 together. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Notice that he spoke from heaven, and he lets us know that we're to have respect and serve him and we're to praise him we're to live in a manner in which God is well pleased why because God is real he is what he is real and the last time we were together we talked about in the question do you fear do you have the fear of God? We talked about Joseph. And Joseph was a young man who had reverence for God, fear of God. Again, not a fear that is perverted, but a fear that says, I have a deep-seated love and respect and an acknowledgement for him who is real. In fact, I will listen and do his will above what others may ask me to do that I know he doesn't want me to do. I'm going to stay with God. I'm going to hold my convictions in line with what I know he has revealed to me in my heart. You see, in the Bible, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Would you all like to know where that is? 
It sure sounds like a good scripture to quote, but it'll be good if you see it. Turn over to Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and we'll look at Proverbs chapter 20, let's see here, uh, chapter 20, verse 27. Chapter 20, verse 27 of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. It says, the spirit of man is the what? The candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. Now what he's saying there is that God reveals himself to everyone, but he does it in their spirit. Your spirit is the center and core of your being. Your spirit is who you are. Your spirit is referred to as your heart. And when he uses the word heart in the Bible, he's not referring to your blood pump that pushes the blood around in your physical body. He's referring to the center and core of your being, your spirit. And so that's why the Apostle Paul, writing to the believers in Thessalonica, he said, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he talks about you ought to know what you've been taught by God, how to preserve your body and live according to his will. God talks to your heart. In Romans chapter 1, the Bible talks about how God has made it clear to everyone that he is real. He has made it clear unto them that you should serve him. Why? Because every person that breathes breath in this world, that came into this world, they received their life from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God who is the father of spirits, according to the book of Hebrews, he expects us to listen to him in our spirit. He goes with that more than he does your feelings. Why? Because your feelings are subject to change. And your mind can have all kinds of ideas thrown at it that alter reality. You know, God really knows the makeup of your being. You are a tripartite being. Tri, it means three-part being. You are a spirit. You have a soul and you live inside of a physical body. And therefore, God talks to you in your spirit because the spirit is the real you. And so here in Romans, I'll go and just read from Romans chapter 1. Turn over and look at that. Romans chapter 1. It corroborates or agrees with Proverbs 20 verse 27, which says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. Romans chapter 1 goes to reference Proverbs 20, verse 27, because God says, I made it clear inside your heart. You know what's going on. It's real easy for God to say, I know that you know what's going on, because God says in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, he says, men look on the outside, but God says, I'm looking at your heart. I know what you're thinking. I know what's in your heart, and I know your actions. I made the eyes, I can certainly see. I made your ears, I can certainly hear. And therefore, God says, I'm looking at you according to your heart. Now, some people say, well, you know, God knows my heart. Therefore, I can go up, I can go out and cut up and do all of the stuff. God knows my heart. In my heart, you know, I just have good intentions. But see, God knows really what's going on in your heart. If you purpose to do dirt and say, praise the Lord, God will forgive me. I apologize, Lord, but I'm going to do dirt the next minute I get a chance to. It's kind of like a person says, I repent for stealing, but they're looking for the next person who they could pickpocket. God says, I know what's in your heart. See, you told everybody, I'm sorry, Lord, for pickpocketing or stealing. But God says, but I heard you in your heart. I was listening to your heart. I saw what you were saying in your heart. I'm looking for the next victim I can get a hold of. God says, I know what's in your heart. Who is he that will ascend unto the most high? The hill of the most high. He that has what? Clean hands. And a what? A pure heart. That means you ought to be thinking about what's going on in your heart. 
What are you really, really thinking about in the deep recesses of your heart? There are plenty of people that do all kinds of external things in a, let's say, a, a movie role. There are people that played the part of Jesus in movie roles and gone out and lived like the devil. Why? Because they weren't living the scriptures that they were quoting in their heart. They were simply saying it from their head and their trained bodies to be an acting tool. And God says, I want you to have your heart right with me. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, you know the truth and you may have the truth in you, but there are individuals who are willing to do ungodly things claiming that, hey, look, it's all good. And God's like, look, I know you know the truth and you're willing to hold the truth in unrighteousness. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest where? In them, circle the word in them. So God says, I'm talking to you. And really, we know that people have to have somebody giving them a code of moral code in their heart. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any judicial system anywhere in this country or around the world. There are judicial systems because people know right from wrong. I don't care what culture you live in on the planet. There is a judicial knowing in your heart. There is a right way and there is a wrong way. And God says, I put that in you so that you would know right when you see right. And guess who is right? Jesus is right. And so he says in verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and what? Godhead. Circle the word Godhead, because the word Godhead is referring to God and his plurality. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And some people say, well, are you a Trinitarian? I'm like, look, it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Do you believe in the Trinity? I'm telling you, I believe in the Godhead. Oh, what do you mean? You're a Trinitarian. There's no such word as a Trinity in the Bible. I know that. That's why I'm answering you the way I am. I'm telling you, there is a Godhead. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So if they can't get you on that, they'll try to get you on something else. Verse 20, still with me? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, so that they are without excuse. Now that's what God says. God says you're without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, When did they know him? Well, every child that comes into the world knows God. In their heart, they just know him. Do you know little children knows? They know when they're being abused. They know when they're not being loved, and they know when they are being loved. There's an expectation that a a child has in their heart from their parents. They just know something, just something on the inside of them says, you ought to protect me. There's something on the inside of them that says, you ought to look out for my well-being. In fact, I was, you know, kind of like fell asleep last night with my television on. I was looking at own channel, OWN, you know, that's Oprah Winfrey Network. And, uh. There was a lady on there, it's a, I don't forget the lady, how do you say the lady's name, such and such, fix my life. And she was dealing with a couple of girls and a mother that had lived in an abusive way. And these girls were really upset because they're like, you know what, mom should have been there for us, mom should have been there for us. And I applaud anyone who says, I want to help people live a better life. I'm so glad to see people get counseled and get help, you understand. But where did the kids learn that their mom should have been there to protect them? Where did they get that from? They got that from God. A little child knows when you lie to it. How does a child know when you lie to it? They get that from who? From God. How does a child know when you stole from them? They get that from God. How does a child know that if you were to be cruel to them, 
They'd like the girls on the, on the program, they were the ladies, they were talking about, mom would leave us and leave us with the tyrant, her boyfriend, her latest boyfriend, and he would beat us. And I, I, my sister showed mom the bruises on the neck and said, mom, please don't leave us with this brute. But she did anyway, and it just crushed their hearts. Why would it crush their hearts? Crush their hearts, crush their hearts in their spirit. There's some things that this, they have an expectation of. If you don't fulfill it, it's going to disturb them. In the book of Proverbs, the Bible says that the spirit of man sustains his, him during t- the times of infirmity, during the times of challenges. Your spirit has to be your most, most important thing that you are aware of. And that's why the Bible says guard your heart or guard your spirit with all diligence. Why? Because out of your heart flows the issues of life. See, you're going to live according to what's going on down in here. I know people go to school and they get educated and they're like, oh, you know, I just, I have all of these degrees. But there are a lot of people with degrees that can't live life successfully. They don't live life successfully. Why? Because it's not what's up here. It's what's down here is how you're going to live and speak and make decisions. So the Bible talks to you about getting your spirit fed with the word of God. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God's word is food for your spirit. And so in Romans chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 20, the latter part of verse 20, it says, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart. Their, what, what does that word heart mean? Their spirit. Their foolish heart or spirit was what? was darkened. See, you didn't come into the world a dummy. You came into the world having a knowledge of God in you. Turn over to John's Gospel, chapter 1. See, God, the real God, the God that created the heavens and the earth, he really does know how your composition operates. He knows you are a spirit, and he talks to you from in your spirit. Now look at John's gospel, the gospel of John, chapter 1, and I'll read in verse 1, John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Him who? Him who is the Word. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And life, and the life was the what? Light of men. And the light shineth in, the, in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. That all men, how many men? That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, referring to John, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light. Now, the word true implies or says directly that there are false lights, but Jesus is the what? True light. Now, notice in verse 9, which lighteth how many men? How many men? Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now this explains how that Nebuchadnezzar, who was the leader of the Babylonian dynasty, how that when Nebuchadnezzar had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace and he saw four men walking around in the fire and he said to his assistant or a person that was by him, he said, how many people did we throw in the fire? He said, the assistant said, three, my Lord. He said, but I see four men in the fire. And notice what Nebuchadnezzar said. Babylonian pagan, don't even, he don't even know God. 
Although God deals with him and gives him dreams and God talks to him because he's a leader of the, at that time, the known world, the civilized world was all under his leadership. But Nebuchadnezzar said this, and the fourth man that I see in the fire looks like the what? The son of God. See, God says, Jesus Christ is that true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That's why I can leave. I can leave right now and go to the remotest part of the world and go and preach Jesus to people there. And they'll have a connection with that. Why? Because in their heart, they know that they got their life and their light from Jesus. You just know it. Now, a person's heart can be darkened if they reject the preaching of the gospel. If they reject the true light of the gospel that Jesus is Lord and Savior. If they reject that, you understand, their heart can become foolish and they can go into some real dark behavior, which is listed in Romans chapter 1. Start calling birds God, start bowing down to trees, start talking about Mother Earth. The earth was made by God. The earth didn't have any life outside of God giving it life. Start calling God. She, and the Bible clearly says when Jesus prayed, our father, he didn't say our oh, God mother. No, I'm just saying, see, people will try to change what the Bible says, but yet in their attempt to change what the Bible says, then they go out and quote parts of the Bible that they just got finished saying that they can't agree with. Why would you then say any of this if you don't agree with all of it? Are you all getting what I'm telling you? Where's your logic? Be logical. In other words, when you approach the scriptures, don't just think, well, it just appeals to my spirit and my spirit is fed. But it's also it's food for your soul as well, because you can receive the engrafted word. That means etchable word. You can receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, referring to Christians in the book of James chapter one. That means that if you as a Christian allow God's word to be fed to you and you keep hearing the word, keep hearing the word, you your thinking is going to be changed to think like God thinks. And when he talks to your heart, your thinking won't go contrary to his word because you've been listening to his word and you understand his voice. You hear his voice very clearly and you have a printed record to know that it's him talking to you. God doesn't just leave it for anybody to say, well, you know what, I've, I've, I've got something going on down in here. And anything that's supernatural down in here, it just has to be from God. You got to be joking. The devil is a spirit as well. But the devil is all about hurting you. You better know the difference between God and the devil. And the only way to know the difference is through the word, which is called a two-edged sword that is alive and powerful and able to make a division between what's going on between the devil's will and God's will. Between what your flesh desires versus what your heart really desires versus what your mind desires. There's only one instrument in all of humanity that makes a divi division or a, a, a slice, a smooth, clear cut between what's really going on behind the scene. That's the Bible. The only book on the planet. The only book on the planet. And the Bible keeps leading people to Jesus. Now then, turn over in your Bibles. You're still there in John's Gospel. Notice here in John's Gospel, chapter 1, notice in verse 14. And the word of God, well, you know, it's so good. Hold on. Verse 9 is where I left off, wasn't it? Okay, John chapter 1, verse 9. Notice, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And what he's saying here is, when a person receives him, Jesus, as their personal Lord and Savior, you have the power from God to become his very own son or his very own child. Now, the Bible says here 
is verse 12. It says, but as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If everybody on the planet is a son of God, a child of God, then why would he have need to give you power to become the son of God if you already are a son of God? See, that blows that doctrine or that thought of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. Yeah, God is the father in that he is, he is the creator of all humans, but every human has not chosen to make God their father. There are people who literally reject him, and God says, when you reject him, then guess what? You out. You not in. You don't have the power to become a son of God. And when you have a power given to you to become a son of God, he describes it as being born again. He says, which were born, notice that, which were born in verse 13, which were born not of, the, uh, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. That means all of those who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're called born again ones. And the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And that beholding of all things become new means that you pay attention now. You start learning from the word how your heart has been changed. You are a new creation. And as a new creation person born of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you, and he wants to work on the outside. But the only way he can work on the outside is if you have faith, because faith is what allows God to move on your behalf. And he gave you the free gift of faith. And therefore, you must learn to walk by faith and not by sight. You must learn how to walk in the reverence of God. How do you learn to walk in the reverence of God? Say, I'm going to let my spirit, whom, God, whom God, God has purchased, God has bought me by his precious blood, God lives on the inside of me, I'm going to let my spirit tell me what to do as opposed to my flesh. I mean, because the guy, there was a guy that sang a song, Billy Paul, y'all remember that? Me and Mrs. Jones, we got a thing going on. We both know that it's wrong. But it's much too strong to let it go now. We meet every day, 6.30 in the morning at the cafe. We, you know, and all that kind of stuff he was singing. And that was a very popular song. But he said, we both know that it's wrong, but it's much too strong to let it go now. What's he referring to as much too strong to let it go now? His flesh and his soul. If he was really a born-again man, he would say, you know what? On the inside of my heart, I'm tell God's telling me. I shouldn't be doing it, and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to obey God. In fact, the preacher was just talking about that at church. But see, if a Christian does not give themselves over to the study of God's word, then they can be made conformable unto the world and actions. Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Look at this. Romans 12. See, because you are a three-part being, you have to be aware that your spirit is born again as a believer in Christ Jesus. You're born not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of blood, nor of the will of man. That means nobody can come to you and say, I declare you are a Christian in that work. It doesn't work like that. Well, my parents were Christians, therefore I'm just, I was always a Christian. I was born a Christian. I'm always a Christian. No, that doesn't work either. You have to come to a place where you decide for yourself that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Somebody says, well, I don't ever remember being born again. Where do you need to pray today and ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart? And I'm not being funny in that I'm trying to make this a joke. This is not a joke. You, this is much too much too serious for you to play with this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, the apostle Paul writing to the believers in Rome, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present what? Your body. You, notice, you present your body. Somebody say, well, Lord, take my children and do what you're going to do with them because I give them over to you. God says, look, look, look they came out of you. Now, you can say you will live a dedicated life, which will allow your children to be informed in the word. But you know what? Your children are your responsibility. And if you train up your child in the way they should go, when they're old, they'll not depart from it. You can hold me to that. 
But you can't say, God, you know, I'm just throwing all my children over on you. Now you raise them and just let them go. and Do whatever you want to do and let them go. No, it don't work like that. If you're an ignorant parent, you're going to have ignorant kids for the most part, unless the child decides, you know what, this is much too hard to live like this. I think I need to be informed in the word because I don't want to be like mom and dad. Mom or dad or both. David, King David said when I was a child, he said, you know, if my mom and my dad forsake me, the Lord will take me up. In other words, the Lord will take me up and he'll raise me. And actually that's what happened. David was raised by the Spirit of God. God taught David how to function. Even Jesus. God taught Jesus how to think. So when he was in the temple as a little boy, Jesus, when he was in the temple, his mom said, you worried us. He said, well, don't you know I should be about my father's business? And it's like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. These are my parents. I better go, and we'll go with him. <laughs> his supposed father, Joseph, and his mother, Mary. Point being is this. God talks to people's hearts. And he expects us to get our minds renewed with the word. Notice in Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Underline the word reasonable. That means you got to have some reasons. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace of God given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So everybody in Christ Jesus, you have the same measure of faith. Well, how do I let the, my life as of faith, how do I let that faith that's on the inside of me, how do I let that affect the outside? Ah, the way you let it affect the outside is the more you get into the word, the more your actions just start transforming into the image of Christ. See, I received Jesus when I was five years of age, but my actions uh, didn't really show that I had a strong faith and confidence in God until I started getting into the word. I mean, I was doing all kinds of stuff. That's why when people tell me, oh, pastor, you don't understand. Are you kidding me? I was once without the knowledge of the, of the word of God. I would go to church. Then you didn't have to go. To, you didn't have to bring a Bible to church. The preacher didn't preach from the Bible. We didn't have to bring a Bible. We weren't studying the Bible. And it was more of a social thing. It was more of an, a political thing. It was not a thing where you had to come and learn and grow and be disciplined to to understand the scriptures. And you dare not ask the minister no scriptural question. Why? Because he didn't know how to answer the question. He didn't believe it. He got his thing going. And consequently, being in that environment, his ignorance and my ignorance, and then living in a physical body and a mind that didn't know the word of God, I'm like, I'm doing, I cut up. I cut up too. And when I say I cut up too, I mean the first time, the only time, but the first time, the only time I got drunk was at a choir, a choir party. And I got to quit because I run out of time. But I want to encourage you. Do you have the fear of God? Are you learning the word of God? I love you. Come back again and join with us at Spirit Food Christian Center. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Oh, the word of God, how good it is. Hi. My name is Pastor Gary D. Ziegler. I am the pastor of Spirit Food Christian Center. I want to invite you to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you pray this prayer with me, you will be born again. The Bible is very clear in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us pray together. Repeat these words after me. Dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus because I believe with all my heart that you raised him from the dead. I believe that he was crucified. His blood was shed so that I could be right with you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for causing me to be born again. 
I receive now Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. Therefore, I now know I am your child and I'll live with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Gary Ziegler of Spirit Food Christian Center. It's our pleasure to bring you the word of God. The Bible says, for man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Would you prayerfully consider what God can do in your life to help you in the support of this ministry? We believe those who sow into this ministry will be blessed abundantly. And therefore, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Let us give together so that we can rejoice together in the growth and the glory of the Lord in this ministry of Spirit Food Christian Center. God bless you and have a wonderful day. You have been watching the Spirit Food Christian Center worldwide webcast online at www.myspiritfood.com. Join us for worship service each Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And be sure to check out our website for our weekly live broadcast and much, much more. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good.